Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Biz2 Credit Latino Small Business Credit Study. My name is Anita Campbell, and I'm the moderator today. And we're joined by an excellent uh, group of people here today. So I'd like to uh, uh, welcome everyone to the webinar. We will take about one hour. And of that, we'll try to talk for about uh, 40, 45 minutes. And we're going to allow time at the end, assuming we have some time, for your questions. Uh, just a few housekeeping details before I introduce everyone. Uh, I'd like to uh, ask that if you have questions, to please type them into the chat box that you see on the webinar screen. Uh, in most places, it'll be over to the right. You'll see the controls. There's a little chat box. And you can put your questions in there. And we'll try to cover as many questions as we can at the end. We'll also be getting questions that have been emailed into us, as well as questions that are coming through Twitter. Uh, and we'll try to cover as many of those questions as well. With that, I'd like to uh, introduce our panelists today. As you can see, um, that's me, being the only woman on the screen, <laughs> Anita Gamble. And I'm an entrepreneur and small business owner. I've had my own business now for uh, over, uh, actually, 13 years. And uh, I run a uh, media publication called Small Business Trends uh, with a variety of websites, including Small Business Trends, Biz Sugar, Tweak Your Biz, uh, we now have a digital magazine, uh, and we run a series of awards. And of course, uh, we have uh, a mission to make uh, success for small businesses. And so that is what we do in our publication, and that is what we try to live with every day. Um, our main sponsor and host of this webinar is Biz2Credit. Uh, an online uh, lending marketplace and platform. And I'd like to introduce Rohit Aurora, the co-founder and CEO. Welcome, Rohit. Yeah, the, Anita, thanks for the kind introduction. And Rohit and uh, much of his team are based in New York City. Uh, and uh, Rohit, of course, is a recognized expert in financing for small business. So we're very uh, grateful, actually, to have his expertise as part of this. Antonio Linzano from Paychex, unfortunately, is not able to be with us. His plane has been delayed. So unless he's able to get off of his plane very quickly and join in sometime later in the webinar, uh, we'll have to go through his material for him. Uh, but um, certainly, uh, we appreciate him actually creating the material and sharing it with us uh, today. And Antonio, uh, if you're hearing this later, uh, we certainly miss you. Uh, and last but not least, I'm very excited to introduce Rafael Cuellar. Rafael is a business owner himself, and he's got some great insights. So Rafael, please introduce yourself. Hi, Anita. Thank you so much for your introduction. Uh, I'm Rafael Cuellar. I guess I'm similar to yourself. I am an entrepreneur. I run several companies, uh, one of the largest being my supermarket entity. Uh, I'm actually one of the owners of the largest retail co-op in the United States, and I have one store in New Jersey, and then, again, I have a couple of other small businesses that I run in, in conjunction with that. Well, welcome, Rafael, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, with that, uh, we'd like to jump in and start talking about uh, Latino-owned businesses. Uh, and. Uh, uh, Rohit, uh, would you like to just give us a background about Latino-owned businesses? Yeah, so I think I think that's a very interesting topic, and uh, I'm also a first-generation immigrant into this country, and Rafael is a is a dear customer of ours also. So uh, you know, we have seen uh, you know what it means to be an immigrant entrepreneur in this country. I think this country has a lot of opportunities. There's just no doubt about it. And at the same point of time, you know, uh, one of the things, uh, one of the missions when we started Biz2Credit and that's still there is to help 
you know underserved uh, entrepreneurs that includes a lot of immigrant entrepreneurs and 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 latinos are the largest of those so obviously you know uh, we uh, see a lot of you know very hard working immigrants who come into this country and set up their own small business they work very hard they are very ethical people very honest people and uh, and i think one of their bigger challenges is uh, besides marketing uh, is to get access to credit because they are not plugged into the financial system in this country and that's where i think uh, best to credit has been doing a lot of work uh, with the uh, latino community over the last 4 to 5 years you know we have done partnerships with companies like univision we have a uh, full fledged spanish platform now uh, you, uh, we have done a lot of work with other latino organizations like latino coalition uh, uh, we also have a lot of uh, micro lenders on our platform including axion and vdc as well as earlier this year we actually uh, did a partnership with us treasury and with uh, city bank and actually uh, did a whole micro lending platform for businesses in uh, in greater dc area washington dc area and the reason i'm mentioning this is because a lot of micro lending in this country actually happens for uh, uh, immigrant uh, entrepreneurs and especially you know 70% of that actually goes to the latino entrepreneurs in this country so that is one of a big source of capital for them and we uh, are doing you know a lot of education for these customers we have a whole virtual cfo platform where we are helping them to you know just learn about their credit worthiness better and all that and i think the best thing is all this is free for the small business owner so we are trying to you know do plus these webinars so i think there's a lot of uh, you know excitement we are seeing in the marketplace especially you know now that the lending markets are coming back the money is starting to come back finally and as the convergence start happening between banks as well as the tech players so i think this is a great time for small business owners who are looking to get access to credit to look at marketplaces like best to credit and you know uh, go and get their money and and grow their business because the economy right now is better than any time in last 6 years yeah, great point. Uh, this is a this is a wonderful time, and uh, you know, knock on wood, it's going to continue for a while. Uh, with that, I'd like to uh, switch over to Rafael Cuellar. Uh Rafael, uh, Anita. First of all, I want to echo something uh, about Rohit and Bits to Credit. I've used them before, and my my businesses aren't necessarily that small. They're pretty decent sized Hispanic owned businesses, but um, that all being said, with large businesses, it's still hard to get capital sometimes. And it's a lot easier to, to find more immediate access to capital by using a strong micro-lending company. And when they say micro-lending, I mean, I know Rohit has been able to do deals up to around $10 million. So that's not yeah. necessarily that micro. Yeah. Um, so that, that's the first thing I wanted to say uh, before I even started. Now, um, as far as everything else, I mean, obviously the Latino business world is booming, right? The fastest growing uh, group of entrepreneurs in the country is Latina women business owned, uh, business owned women companies. So it's a space that's exploding, right? And at the same time, with all that happening, you know, small businesses are shutting down faster than in, in any time in recorded history, right? They used to be every five years, you know, 80% are shut down. Now it's much faster than that. So, so those things are changing as well. Um, and I mean, it's important for small business people to understand that that whole process is all about, you know, understanding how to manage your business. Something a lot of small businesses don't do is open up and be prepared before they open up. They think that they know what they're doing, but there's no business plan, there's no model, there's no real vision of what they're going or what they're trying to do. It's just they're putting a storefront up and trying to sell something. Uh, whether it be service oriented or whether it be retail oriented or whatever the case may be, again, it's not followed up with, or not necessarily followed up, but it's not preceded by, you know, a very organized plan and an organized group of people to help you carry out that plan. I.e., meaning, you know, a good set of lawyers, a good set of accountants, whatever it is that you really need for that business to move forward. Um, I, and before when we were talking about my background, I gave you a little bit about you know me being an entrepreneur, but the reality of it is, is just to elaborate on that is, is that um, I, uh, I own one of 
uh, one supermarket amongst the chain of about 400 uh, that's part of the largest retail cooperative in the United States. My business this year is going to do somewhere in the neighborhood of about $60 million. Next year it's going to do about $70 million. That's just my supermarket business. I also own a couple of other ones. We're opening up a liquor store. It's going to be a large liquor store doing a couple million dollars a year as well. So those are kind of kind of the background. But we're we're getting into a hydroponics company that we're developing in Mexico, and, and the list goes on and on of multitudes of businesses. So that tends to happen as an entrepreneur in this country. Once you, you start to succeed, you do other things. You either grow in the entrepreneurial venture you're in, or you start dabbling in other ones, which has been the case in, the case for us and my family. Um, now, going back to some of the challenges that we have as entrepreneurs in this country, I mean, language is definitely a challenge. So now, I, I am an immigrant, just like Rohit. Luckily, I am an immigrant that came here at nine months old, so I don't really speak with an accent, but I speak both languages. I was educated here. I was in the military here, all those things. But the reality of it is, is that for a lot of us, that's not the case. We come here and the language is a barrier, it's a little bit of, intim of intimidation. And you kind of have to get beyond that. You have to remember that I mean, there's English, so you have to learn English to manage yourself in this country, but you know, it, it's part of, one of some of those challenges that we deal with. And part of that challenge is trying to get access to capital, trying to you know, market your business and not knowing the language well enough, and, and those things all come into play. So you have to be aware of that if that's a problem for you. Um, the other big thing, and this is where business credit is great, uh, is borrowing money. Um, when you're going to start a business, odds are you're going to probably borrow money. Um, you know, in initially, you might capitalize yourself, and then you're going to borrow either money from friends and family, but eventually you're going to hit a banking institution or some something of the like. Um, business credit is great for that, in my opinion, because they really kind of help you and walk you through that process as much as possible and as easy as possible. And at least that's been my experience with them. And uh, you know that's that's invaluable, and that's something that you have to be aware of as well. Because if you have no banking relationship, eventually you're going to have one, or you're going to need one. So you need to start developing that. Uh, and then the other part of being a small business owner that usually comes from the minority community is is that you, you have a poor credit history, or none at all, right? So that's that's hard too. When a bank comes and sees you and looks at your paperwork and you have no credit history, you've never used a credit card or you've never uh, you never bought anything, you've never bought a home or whatever the case may be, those are big challenges that you have to kind of get around, uh, i.e., again, one of those situations where I think this credit is very helpful. But, uh, you know, those are a lot of like major challenges that I see that happen to, you know, smaller entrepreneurs when they start off um, in you know, jumping into that pool of sharks that's out there. Okay, and here we go, some of the advice, I guess. Um, sometimes you're not even hiring anybody, it's just yourself, but when you do get to that next stage is is you've got to hire the right person. And that's not necessarily easy if you've never had that experience. So what I would suggest is try and learn as much about hiring as you can. Um, there's tons of books on it, there's websites about it, but I mean, now, there's that old saying, location, 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 and that's important for your business. Well, from my perspective, location is super important, but hiring the right people to run your business is more important to them, your business doesn't run. And if it's just you, then you're really just buying a job. So the reality of it is, is that if you're going to have a business, uh, you're eventually going to have people, and those people have to be the right people to run your business and do things for you. So that it's really, truly a business and an entrepreneurial venture, as opposed to just an expensive job that you own. Um, understand all the regulations about your business. Um, there's nothing worse than opening up a business and then, surprise, surprise, you know, regulations change, or things are in place that you weren't aware of, and your your plan, your budget, everything you thought was going to be happening, goes to you know, the negative or, or worse, can't even, you know, your business shuts down. So that's that's another important one. Before you open up any kind of business, I'm sh more than likely somebody else has got a business that's similar. Uh, hopefully they're not your competition. And if they're not, don't talk to them. Find out. You know, there's all kinds of organizations out there. There's SBA. There's, you know, um, ways to reach out to different businesses that are in your scope of work or whatever it is that you're doing. 
and that's another big suggestion. You know, go out and get a score representative, get somebody like that, or you know, uh, go out to your SBA office and ask them to help you. They'll be able to do a lot for you as well. And then try to control as much of your capital as you can. Um, you know, there there are circumstances where obviously you know you buy your business, you, you jump in, and you're you're uh, you've got your loans, you've got everything else, but you know, you want to control what's going on. You want to know where the dollars are going, where the cents are going, and not be totally, you know, oblivious to it because you start getting bills and you don't know what you're paying for. This and that. So keep on top of that. The finances of a business are very, very important. It's not just running the business. There's the back end part of the business, which is the finance part of the business, which is again very, very important. And I go back to somebody like SBA has all kinds of coaching and um, you know people that can help you with that if that's new to you. Uh, and if it's not new to you, then it's just old sort, and it's part of what you got to do. It's, you know, 50, 60 percent of your business is really the back part of it, which is managing your money and managing your capital. Uh, and then <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I hear this: people think that, you know, well, I'm going to go ahead and open up my own business, It'll make my life easier. It, it, it's almost comical when I hear that because it's not true. Your life gets a lot harder owning your own business, especially in the beginning. Might get easier later on, and honestly, I haven't got I haven't gotten easier for me yet. But uh, but the reality of it is is that um, it's not easier. You've got to commit yourself to understanding that you got to do whatever it takes if you're going to be successful. If you're going to move forward, you're going to grow. You're going to make it the business that supports you and your family and you know whoever else needs to support it needs to be successful. So for it to be successful, you have to understand it's not easy. It requires those, you know, late nights, early mornings. Uh, it requires you you being, you know, more than just the boss. Being, you know, everything that you need to do. Everything from in, in my business, you know, cutting meat to packing grocery. I mean, it, it can be anything. Uh, and you've got to be aware that that's part of your job as the owner of the business is to jump in wherever you need to jump in and handle it. Because or else, that's how a lot of businesses fail. People think that it's, you know, just a job, and it's not. Mm. Hey, that is fantastic advice, uh, Raphael, and uh, you certainly know uh, from whence you speak, given your own expertise. And I think in the question and answer period, we've already got a few questions from people wanting to know more about how you started your business. So I know we're going to come back to that later. Sure. But for now, let's just move on. Um, if we could, uh, even though Antonio Lozano is not here, uh, let's try to go through at least a few of his slides. And I may call on you, uh, Raphael, and also Rohit at various points to help go through these slides. So let's walk through them, because there's some really good information here. And I'd like to make sure we at least try to cover a little bit of it. So this is a very interesting chart here, showing the percentage of business owners as well as self-employed entrepreneurs by Hispanic segment. And as you look at the different bar chart columns here, what you see is it's broken down according to a generation of how long the Hispanic background person has been in the United States. So on the far left side, something called the Americanizado, um, or, or HA1 uh, is what the chart says. And that's the largest group. I think what's pretty interesting about that is here they are, third plus generation, uh, but still you see that you've got uh, quite a good showing of Hispanic uh, business owners in there. And then as you go further right along these columns, uh, you're progressively getting to the Hispanics who are newer in the United States. Maybe they've been here second generation, or like Raphael, they were an immigrant as a young child. That would be in the that center column. And all the way over to the right, where they might have been an immigrant as an adult, like uh, I happen to know Rohit uh, has been. And that's you know, certainly very admirable when I heard Rohit background and to hear what he's accomplished in basically a decade is absolutely amazing. Uh, and so what you're really seeing here is how much of a wonderful showing there is uh, among these groups as far as being business owners or being self-employed entrepreneurs. 
And I, I guess I would throw it open to uh, either Rohit or Raphael. Do you have anything to add here that what does this really tell you looking at this chart? Rafael, if you want to go first. Uh, I think sure. I'll... I mean, I, I think that, you know, what it tells me is something, I mean, I inherently already knew, obviously, as people become, you know, more Americanizado, or more Americanized, uh, they have more of a tenacity to, you know, be self-employed and be business owners. Um, and, and, and uniquely, um, it's, it's pretty large amongst Hispanics. If you look at it, it's, I mean, a third of the population, pretty much. Right? So that's a significant amount. Uh, what I found really interesting was that in like if you look to immediately to the right it actually drops off a little bit from the one after that so it's funny I think what happens sometimes and I'm, I'm speaking from experience in this sense is, is that um, you know that first generation really you know tries to jump into the business and, and it's tough and then the next generation over or you know more younger people in that first generation are in that like H4 block where you see that large like Hispanic business owner jump and what happens after that is, is that you know your kids become well educated and they become lawyers and doctors and this and that or not necessarily lawyers and doctors but they go to work for corporate America or they go to work for some of these you know large firms and they get their positions and they kind of develop and then the next stage of that is is that you know some of those guys transition and then you've got another generation or even that same generation and they transition back to being entrepreneurs and uh, and basically you know opening up larger businesses and more involved businesses and you know businesses that are higher tech or whatever the case may be and I think that's where you get to that American Salvo point where the numbers really kind of go off the charts. Yeah. Yeah, Rohit, then, anything? Yeah, yeah, I think I think this is very uh, it's a very pertinent slide, you know, that we see that as you know America is known as the melting pot. Uh, you know, I think the key thing here is that a lot of immigrants, you know, who come here by second or third generation, you know, they're very Americanized, you know, uh, stuff. So I think that's that's very interesting. That also, you know, shows that as more Latinos and Asians actually, you know, uh, develop deeper roots here in this country, the overall you know, percentage or market share of the small business owners who will be immigrants will uh, will grow. There was a recent, you know, study from Pew Institute which said that almost 65% of entrepreneurs by by like 2065 would be uh, will be immigrants in this country. So I think that is that is something very very interesting that we we can already see. And I think uh, these are similar issues with either. Hispanic immigrants or with Asian immigrants, you know, uh, uh, I came to this country in 2004 and I think one benefit if you're coming from South Asia is that, you know, you can speak very good English. Uh, but I think except for that, you know, uh, you you are in a new country, you have to do new things and, you know, and that's what, it's a, it's a very interesting, you know, study that, you know, how people who are coming in and, you know, what they're doing and, and obviously with more, uh, experience and more, you know, uh, knowledge of the language, you know, you actually build, you know, businesses and which gets very, like, you know, like of sizable size, I would say. So I, I think this is very interesting, you know, in that sense. And I would add that if you are in uh, any kind of a business that markets to either business owners or markets to Hispanics or both, this is really important to understand also the differences that result from how long um, people have been in this country and the different generational differences there are. And it's pretty dramatic when you see it broken down this way according to third generation, second generation, first generation, and then by how long people have been in uh, the country. You know, there are little micro stories behind this, uh, as you've just heard from Rohit and Raphael about the experiences that people are going through as they come to the United States. And I think it's important to understand that. You know, don't assume that Hispanics are, in fact, um, you know, all the same. And there's very, very much difference. And when it comes to business owners, there's very much difference. And if you are a business owner, a Hispanic business owner, you know, understand um, that you know, there are other people who are going through various stages in this. Uh, it's pretty interesting. Well, let's move on 
I'd like to move on to this chart. This is another one that I think is really important uh, for marketers, and I also think it's great for uh, Hispanic business owners to think about this. To me, this would be a very motivating chart to look at. Uh, and I may actually in a moment call on Raphael to help describe this because I thought you, know, you had a really good handle on this when we were doing the, uh, the pre-review of this. But essentially what I got from this chart is that organic business owners, uh, more so than, um, than the percentages of the regular population as a whole, actually have um, more uh, income, higher income levels uh, than, than uh, uh, the population as a whole. And I think that's pretty interesting. So if you're a business owner and you're wondering, especially if you're in the very early stages of your business where you're struggling just to, you know, make it from month to month, make payroll and so on, uh, you know, when a business is new, you have that, that uncertainty at the beginning. But, you know, just keep thinking about the fact that those who've been there before you and done that, some of them have gone on and have done what very, very well. So Raphael, perhaps you can add a few insights about this chart. Sure. I, I think what was really insightful for me is that 57%, if you look at the, that bottom part of the chart, 57% of Hispanic-owned businesses index higher in the income levels than, than their peers in regular U.S. households. Um, so that was pretty, you know, implicating as far as like, wow, you know, basically these people are doing very, very well. Um, but if you even look at it all the way down, you know, basically you're saying that 39% of, of, you know, Hispanic businesses, and that's the largest one block number, is indexing at, you know, 83% of what U.S. households index. So that means less than 50,000, but that's still, I mean, a pretty high index considering they're entrepreneurs and business owners as opposed to, you know, people who are in jobs and doing, you know, regular run-of-the-mill things every day. So again, if you look at it, I mean, 91% really of that chart, I think is a very positive is a very positive message that comes along for that, you know, minority entrepreneur. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, if you're wondering how many Hispanic-owned businesses there are, here's the answer: over four million in the United States. That's uh, pretty amazing. And look at this. Now, this is really interesting. Look at the growth rate, especially in recent years, how fast uh, the Hispanic-owned firms are growing. And I, I think that's pretty, uh, pretty impressive. Rohit, have you noticed that in uh, connection with the growth of Hispanic-owned business owners uh, coming to biz to credit Have you seen that kind of uh, accelerated growth in recent years? Yeah, so we have seen, you know, in the last two years we have seen the number of applicants have gone up at least by 20, 25 percent, you know, Hispanic businesses which are coming to us. I think the key thing there is that, you know, while the numbers are growing in terms of, I think, business businesses are getting more mature, we are still seeing those handicaps which are there, you know, which will, which we like uh, release the study in terms of, you know, still much less revenue compared to mainstream businesses, much lower credit scores. And, you know, most of these businesses are still, you know, pretty small uh, and also have less, I would say, financial stability still. So I think that is one challenge that we are seeing in them. While, while we are seeing more businesses, you know, get, getting to a stage where they're trying to look for outside credit, uh, you know, in the Hispanic uh, community, which wasn't the case earlier, you know. Mm. Now, if you're wondering where the Hispanic-owned businesses are growing and where that growth is coming from, what I think is fascinating about this chart is how much of this is actually uh, coming from places you wouldn't otherwise um, associate with uh, Hispanic-owned businesses. So here I am. I'm in the east-north-central region uh, near the Great Lakes, and I'm in Ohio. and we also own a home in Florida. So in Florida, we see uh, Hispanic people all the time. In Ohio, it's actually not all that common, but it's pretty amazing to see that we've got 29% growth, one of the largest growth areas uh, in the Great Lakes region. And look at that sort of central mid of the west, north, central at 30% growth. So it's not necessarily where you might think where traditionally the Hispanic 
uh, presence has been more concentrated, that you're seeing it really across the United States. And I think that's, that's pretty amazing. Any other thoughts about this, uh, Raphael? Uh, I mean, it's impressive. I mean, if you really look at it, everything's over 20% indexing. I don't know of too many other communities that are doing that. Uh, and it's really interesting in areas that are extremely populated with Hispanics. If you look at you know the central part of the country and both both end caps of the country, uh, it's really impressive to see that kind of growth. I mean, you know, you would expect that kind of percentage growth in in places where you think you wouldn't expect them. I I would expect them in places like the the mountain region and so on and so forth because eh, you know you have ten Hispanics and two of them own businesses and now it's twenty percent growth. But when you look at places like California, and you look at places like Florida, and you look at places like New York, New Jersey, places like Texas, places like Illinois, um, to still see plus 20% growth, it's it's pretty impactful if you really start to think about it. Mm, absolutely. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the types of business services that Latino-owned companies need and uh, the various solutions and benefits. And I'd actually like to jump to the next slide to talk about this, you know, to really talk about this process of establishing business ownership and what's involved with that. I mean, when you set up a business, I mean, you need a lot of things uh, at the beginning. So you really need, you know, not only to organize your business, whether it's organized as an LLC, or uh, which is really the most popular uh, type of organization, or you just start it as a sole proprietorship and perhaps you run it as a, a DBA, meaning a doing business as, a fictitious name for a while. Uh, but whatever it is, or maybe you decide you're going to establish it as a corporation, or even if you uh, you know, you have a corporation, you decide that for tax reasons you want to establish it as a subchapter S uh, election, uh, which is really just a, a designation for tax treatment with the IRS. There are a lot of things that you need to do relating to that. But once you get past that stage even, and there are many, many things that you need in order to run your business, whether it's accounting, uh, whether it's various uh, compliance things around payroll, for example, complying with the various uh, withholding tax rules and other things, uh, getting insurance, whether it is liability insurance for your business or uh, whether it's some other type of insurance or whether it's insurance benefits for yourself and employees. And today this is a highly, highly complex uh, area and then, of course, you've got the whole area of getting credit. So I'd like to ask, actually, Raphael, as you think back to when you started your business, what were some of the first things you needed and what were the most problematic things to get? All of the above. They're, they're, you know, I mean, you need credit. You need to have some established credit. You need, you know, uh, you need to be able to understand the compliance issues in your own business. Uh, you need insurance day one, I mean, especially just because we're such a litigious society. And you need a good team, I mean, you need a good accounting team, you need a good lawyer, um, and you need all those things. It's not a matter of like which one you need more or less. And I think I, one of the most challenging ones is obviously just, you know, the access to capital part when you're starting a business because there is, you, you have limited resources, you have limited capital, so you're trying to piecemeal everything together and as you have less and less of these other things, you know, you need somebody to provide that access. Yeah, absolutely. Rohit, as you look at the, whether it's uh, Latino-owned business owners or, or actually any kind of immigrant uh, uh, business owner or minority business owner, what do you see are like the, let's say the one or two key needs or things that get in the way uh, of businesses, we talked about you know not how not knowing how to establish credit or having poor credit, but what are some other things? I would say I would say other two or three things is one you know a lot of business owners don't plan ahead of time, you know they're like very you know I would say you know uh, uh, just doing things at the last minute and you know as as a small business owner I can tell you you know business owners are very busy and as Rafael rightly pointed out 
that any anybody who thinks that he's getting into business, he or she is getting into business to get more time or you know more freedom. I think they should uh, just toss that idea away, you know, out of their mind because it's like going to be a lot more responsibility uh, and a lot more things to do. So I think that's where you know a lot of business owners. Uh, like we see, you know, a lot of time, you know, they're entering into the busy season and they need money, and then, you know, at the last minute they're, scam they're scampering around. You know, the other thing that we find is that, you know, they have, they don't keep their paperwork in place, so they won't have their tax returns and their other financials in one place, so they're just like scampering around trying to get that. So they're not very organized, you know, in that sense. And then the other things that, you know, we see is that, you know, also, you know, they're very poor. You know, uh, understanding of the cash flow of their business. You know, like how they are doing. You know, what thing, thing they they can do. I'm surprised to see so many small business owners. You know, who actually don't even collect their account receivables on time. You know, they won't even call up their creditors, they, or they just forget, or they and they you know don't like get an idea of how to balance their account receivables with account payables. And why I'm saying all this is because you know. It just gives a poor reflection of your business to any creditor than when you are going to go and borrow money. Because if they see a lot of bounce checks, bounce payments in your accounts, they see, you know, that your business is having a chronic cash flow problem, you know, they won't give you money or they will actually make you run or go through more hoops and loops. So I think being well organized, being planned ahead of time and really, you know, having like balance your books, you know, that is something very important. You have to look at your books. I know m most of the small business owners hate looking at their financial books. But you know that's something they have to look at it. You know they have to be very clear about it. You know they need to look at their cash flow every 15 days, every month. They should not just leave it to their bookkeeper or to their accountant to do that. You know obviously the bookkeeper and accountant can do that, but they need to learn to uh, or, or to read that and also uh, you know know all the implications about it. You know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, to keep things moving, let's just segue on, Rohit, into the material that you have to present. So why don't you continue on and just prompt me to advance the slides. Yeah. Uh, so as, as I said during my introduction, you know, Bistocrat is a company we founded in 2007, uh, you know, uh, prior to the recession. So obviously, you know, we have seen some very t tough time and now we are seeing some good times. So I think that's one key learning as a small business owner that I always had is that you have to stick through bad times. You know, you cannot just give up, give up because if you if you stick around and I think Rafael's story is very impressive in that sense that you know, you know, he has built a business, he has built multiple businesses. So the idea is that you know you have to stick around and you also have to provide value to your customers. I think that's the biggest thing because if you're in a business and you can provide value to your customers, you know, you can actually you will you will you will you will not only survive but you will thrive. It takes some time, but it will happen. So I think ha having the patience and having the ability to do things. And why I'm saying all this is because you know what you see here today. You know we are one of the top marketplace lenders in the country. You know we have now over 175 employees, everything. But it's not easy. You know it doesn't come so easy. It it takes time. It takes uh, you know uh, time to do things. And, and like any good business, you know it takes time to build a business. So I think have that patience. You know to do it. And I think one of the things that Bistocrat we are doing, we are very fortunate, is that while we are building our own business, we are able to help a lot of small businesses to build their business. And that shows up in all the resources we provide and, you know, we are growing pretty quick. And we did a recent study which we are doing on an annual basis on Latino businesses. And, and I think, as I was saying, you know, Latino businesses, you know, they are, and the Latino women businesses are the fastest growing, you know, sub-segment of small business owners in the country. And the key thing is that, you know, uh, still their average annual revenue is less, you know, uh, their operating expenses were significantly lower, which is because the fact that a lot of the Latino businesses are owner operated uh, and they're run by owners and their families. So they take very low salaries and the overheads are lower. I think the key thing, other things to look at is, you know, they're relatively younger businesses. So more Latino businesses fail actually, you know, than mainstream businesses because of other reasons they get less you know, access to credit, they have less support system, uh, you know, out there. Uh, and I think the key thing there is that, you know, we uh, are seeing that, you know, and unfortunately because they have less access to credit and less, you know, opportunities and also, you know, they don't know much uh, as, as Rafael rightly pointed out, they have thin credit files, you know, so their credit scores are lower and that I think creates a lot of issues for them because Unfortunately or unfortunately in this country, you know, your 
your progress and your access to credit is very, very dependent on your credit score. So I think that's where a lot of these people need to, uh, you know, immigrant businesses need to understand the importance of that because we come from countries, you know, where credit score is not there. So we don't really get that, you know, initially here in US. And I think that's where it is very important that, you know, if you're planning to be a small business owner, you need to plan it a few years prior to even opening up your own business. And, and you need to, you know, keep your things, uh, you know really well and I think that's something very important because we are seeing you know the businesses are booming you, you know there are uh, you know three million plus businesses uh, you know some people say it's four million because there are a lot of sole props you know uh, it's already generating over 500 billion in sales annually you know which uh, in the overall scheme of things is still pretty less but you know it is growing because it's expected to double and I think uh, in all our studies that we have done with Latino businesses, I would say securing capital is among the top two issues across the country. So it's not just in certain regions. Uh, with, with, with mainstream businesses, you know, we find access to credit is, is challenging, but, you know, there are other issues that, you know, a lot of businesses feel more strongly about. But with the immigrant businesses, especially Latino businesses, we find securing capital is, a, is among the top two issues uh, around, the, around the country. So I think as as we had showed in the earlier slides, you know, the good news is Latino businesses are spreading across the country. So they're not just anymore in states where Latino population is very big, whether it's California or Florida or te Texas, and they're growing, you know, and they're also actually getting into more services business, more knowledge-driven businesses, which I think is actually a good news uh, because that will clearly help these businesses to go to the next level pretty quickly on their own. So I think I think those are the things that, you know, are very important. You know, what we are seeing is, you know, um, from a, uh, you know, a loan demand perspective, you know, Texas, California, Florida, New York and Georgia are still the highest because, you know, these are the places where, you know, Latino businesses have a critical mass, they have certain age, a certain, you know, pedigree of the businesses. Uh, and we, we foresee that over next two to three years time, you know, this will look pretty different because as Hispanic-owned businesses are moving into other parts of the country, the, or the loan demand will start coming more and more. Uh, but at the same point of time, you know, businesses in, let's say, Texas or, or in New York, uh, you know, are actually, and, and also now California, are actually, you know, uh, starting to pick uh, and gather a lot of steam because the economy has got better in these states. So I think they have actually gone stronger. So I, I think that's a very interesting aspect. Uh, Anita, if you can go to the next slide, yeah. So I think what we have been trying to do is that, you know, we have been trying to actually build programs with, you know, with the banks, non-banks, micro lenders, as well as, you know, what we call our institutional platform, which is, you know, we have, you know, funding options from, uh, you know, credit funds from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, family offices uh, and other folks, as well as CDFIs, micro lenders. And one of our aims, as I said during the initial piece of the call, uh, you know, we also formed something known as DC Small Biz Loans, is that, you know, we are trying to figure out ways that we can help, you know, Latino businesses in various ways. So somebody who is a micro business, small business, we can help through CDFI. Somebody of Rafael size, you know, we can actually give them money through our institutional funds, you know, which is money coming in from credit funds, family offices, insurance companies. Uh, then we have a large number of banks who are participating on our platform. And then, you know, we also offer multiple products. So we offer commercial real estate, we offer uh, 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 working capital, and we are also launching equipment financing products very soon. So the idea is that, you know, for any business, especially Latino businesses, you know, we can help them in so many different ways. Because if uh, we strongly feel that if we can help them with access to credit, then they will be able to grow faster and also will be able to, you know, take advantage of this situation. Because what happens during you know, when the economy starts improving, the businesses which have more access to capital will actually outgrow other businesses very quickly. And then when the next recession comes, you know, those businesses have a higher probability of surviving than the businesses which was having a hard time in getting access to credit during good times. So I think this is where, you know, it gets very important that uh, for a lot of businesses who are looking to borrow money should do it at this point of time, even if they don't need it, a lot of it, because it helps them to build a credit history, it, tells them to build, uh, build credibility and it also puts them on a path of being more disciplined because when every month you have to make your loan payments back on time you get very disciplined you are like you know really you start looking at your cash flow you start looking at your you know how much money is coming in how much money is going out 
So I think those are very important aspects because that's just the, as Rafael rightly said, that's the next step of your growth. You know, if you have to grow your business, a time will come when you will run out of your own resources and you will need, uh, you know, outside resources. So this is just, you know, going in that direction. Uh, we can go on the next slide, you know. So I think uh, a, a question that a lot of people ask us, how long it takes. So I think the good news is now on Bistrocat platform is that, you know, we have an online platform which where all the origination, underwriting and servicing happen. And our take on that is that, you know, we are able to do all that kind of that stuff within, you know, so you can fill out an application within 10 to 15 minutes. Underwriting can happen between three to four hours and you can get your money in as little as 24 hours to as much as a week. Uh, so we've cut down a lot on, the, on that time. You know, we are also cutting down on the cost of money, you know, because when we started doing uh, faster credit, you know, initially the cost of money was much higher, but now we are trying to, and we have brought it down and our average APRs in alternative lending space are anywhere between 12 to uh, 18, 19%. We also do a lot of bank loans and we also are now helping banks to buy loans off our platform. So what that means is that even if you get money between 12 to 18% and you're paying back on time for some time, we'll, we'll actually, we are facilitating more banks to come and buy those loans off our platform and then give it uh, you a better pricing and longer terms. Uh, that also takes out the need for filling out a lot of tedious documentation. And the good news is it's all free, you know, so you can create an account, you can apply for loans, you will get pre-qualified pretty quickly. You can look at your options. You can talk to a loan specialist. So we have both English and Spanish loan specialists that you can talk to. We have an English and a Spanish website or a whole platform. Forms are also in Spanish. And I think the other thing is that, you know, it also gives you an ability to, you know, keep track. You can upload all your documents from there. You can see all your loan balances. You can see when you're ready for your next loan. So I think those are the things that becomes very interesting because now, you know, biz to credit becomes like your virtual CFO kind of a platform where you can do everything that you want to do uh, without a need uh, to, you know, search for documentation, go out and do other things out there, you know. Thank you. So I think that's very important. So this is an example of, you know, our uh, Hispanic website and actually what you see this video is of Rafael, you know, uh, he describing, you know, what kind of business he is in and, you know, how Vista Credit helped him get, you know, money that he needed to grow his business. Uh, so we have a lot of resources, you know, we, have, we do webinars, we bring out newsletters, you know, we have these uh, video t testimonials, so you can go and look at it, you can see that, you know, what other business owners have got, what other things that they are doing that you can do, we have financial calculators. Uh, so we have a, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, resources uh, for people, we have, you know, uh, we give 10 GB free, document management, you know, space on the platform because that that's very important because again, you can store all your documents, you can, you know, share it with uh, with your, with, with the lenders as well as, you know, other, other people out there. And that also, you know, helps you to just keep everything in one place and you can access it from anywhere. It's all secured it's, and it's in a cloud environment and that's all free. So you don't have to pay us any money to use their document management system or to get free updates on your credit score, on your cash flow, on your revenue every month. So the idea is that, you know, we, we are saying to a lot of people that guys, you know, we will help you with everything that you need to run your business. And we are, you know, guiding you, we are helping you to benchmark your businesses. And I think the idea is that, you know, get loans quick, you know, as we said, you know, there are personal asset loans, but you know, there are cash advances, which you can get in day or two, then there are micro loans coming from Axion and other places. And then there, and then there are traditional loans, you know, which are traditional working capital loans which you can get, you know, in less than a week now and then, you know, the bank loans can take between two to four weeks. So we have a whole gamut of products and we can, you know, help you to, you know, get to a point where you can get the money you want and you can constantly keep improving your credit profile and can get more money from that point onwards. So you never have to worry about, you know, that if I borrowed money in a rush, I'm, I'm getting a higher price or how can I get better money down the line. So I think that's a very important aspect, you know, for a lot of business owners because they don't have time and they don't have ability to do things on their own. And I think uh, someone like uh, Rafael also has taken advantage of our platform. You know, you can actually, you know, uh, do a lot of benchmarking. You can set up your, you can sync up your bank accounts, you can sync up your payment accounts, your payroll accounts, and we will do all the analysis for you free, of course.
cost. So, so all that is free for any any business owner. Yeah, very good. Very good, Rohit. That, that's um, very impressive, and uh, congratulations on launching the Spanish language platform. That's great. Thank you. All right. Well, we have a few minutes now for questions. We have about 10 minutes, and I've got a few questions uh, in here already. Uh, I'd like to go back to Raphael for a few minutes. Uh, and. There's a lot of uh, curiosity, Raphael, here about your own background in your entrepreneurial journey. You described a little bit of where you are today, and, and you're actually running a quite sizable business uh, enterprises. Uh, but obviously, you must have started somewhere smaller. Could you explain a little bit about how you started your business, where you started it, what, what size it was when you started it, and how did it how did it grow? I mean, how long did it take to grow? That sort of thing. People want to know. Sure. Um, I guess it's an interesting story in the sense that my my parents actually came here from Cuba. And a couple of years of being in this country, about four or five years of being in this country, they finally opened up a small little mom and pop shop, mom and pop like supermarket, little grocery store, a bodega. And uh, that's how it all started. I mean, I started working in my family business when I was about six years old. And I did that for a little bit more than a decade, and then I left. I left and joined the military for a decade. Uh, my family transitioned out of their smaller bodega to a bigger bodega. I would say a small supermarket. It was about 12,000 square feet or so. And they were doing pretty well. I mean, it was doing okay. And then 10 years into my military career, and having become an officer, and having gotten all kinds of leadership experience, and all kinds of things, my father passed away very suddenly. I, I returned to my family business, um, took that over, and within about a year, took it from being over a million dollars in debt and, uh, you know, almost at that point teetering to fail, to becoming one of the highest per square foot selling retail supermarkets in the nation, uh, even though it was only 12,000 square feet. Um, so. That was that first transition into the, into the business world now as an adult, as an entrepreneur, and being able to go somewhere else with it. I, I ran that business for a decade as well, and then eventually got to the point where I was getting ready to sell it because I understand that it was a family business, so 75% of the income for the business went to my family and 25% came to me, so I was doing 100% of the work, and there was a disparity there, which I, I just kind of got tired of and said, I'm going to go back and go to medical school. So in the process of doing all of that, um, Wake from Food Corporation, which is the uh, cooperative that I belong to today, which is, again, the largest retail co-op in the United States, came and knocked on my door and basically said, we would like for you to become one of our members uh, for the second time, actually. And um, it was kind of a, once I feel like it's a godfather story. It was one of those, you can't really refuse this. It's too good of an opportunity to pass up. Uh, and I walked into their co-op. And ostensibly bought into the worst store they had in the co-op. It was uh, one of their corporate stores. It was probably the lowest volume store in the entire cooperative. And we took over that store. Uh, fast forward to today, 10 years later, that store is doing triple the volume that it did when we took it over. And understand that in an industry where you grow at 1%, 2% a year, to triple its sales in 10 years is, is pretty interesting. It's, it's been an interesting journey along the way. Yeah, very, very interesting story, and, and it really goes to show that people can have um, interesting twining uh, and, uh, you know, let's say indirect paths to becoming business owners. So sure. Congratulations. Last, I'll be honest with you, Anita, the last thing I ever thought in my entire world was that I would come back and become an entrepreneur. I was a military officer, and I was expecting to go to medical school and become a, a Navy surgeon. That was really the trajectory I was on, and life just changed to, to the necessity of my family and then it became where my world became what my world became part of absolutely absolutely um, okay um, let's see another uh, another question I've got here uh, for Rohit actually is Rohit how many lenders are part of biz to credit and uh, you know, how does that actually help someone who is applying for credit? So if I'm a Hispanic or other business owner, I'm applying for credit, how many potential lenders can I see, and how do I make that work to my advantage? 
Yeah, so I think I think that's a very good question. So I think what we have done over the years that as the business has grown, so you know, we used to have you know hundreds of lenders on our platform, you know, looking at or competing against each other, trying to get access to credit or or, or trying to give access to credit to business owners. Now, what we found out was that you know uh, uh, it's not just a question of having you know a lot of lenders. It's also a question of you know who is the right fit for you. So now over the last two three years, what we have done is that we have become from a origination marketplace to a fulfillment marketplace so we we still have you know a lot, lot of options you know out there so we have you know you know 80 to 100 banks we have you know another 30 40 non bank lenders but what we have now done is that you know instead of you know just matching you with the right option and then you know helping you with all your paperwork and everything else what we are now doing is that we are saying okay guys you know you come to us for money and and we need to ensure that you get the money in the timely fashion at the right price, at the right term, and as you keep paying us back the money, your term should improve and your price should go down. So what we have done over the last two, three years is that you know we have actually brought our brought the whole underwriting and the servicing uh, you know processes in house. That is within Best to Credit. Now all the banks and non banks which participate on our platform, you know, we tell them that okay, you know, you are a provider of capital, but you normally you guys don't do a very good job in underwriting or servicing and that and that takes very long uh, so we will be able to do it now that has been a very good experience for the customers because you know earlier an example is that if you if as a business owner somebody wanted hundred thousand or two hundred thousand dollars you know they could get matched instantly they could upload their documents but it you it still used to take at least two to three weeks for them to get the money now by bringing this whole control in-house for the customers then that's free for them still is that you know we can actually disperse the actual money within you know three to four days also because as Rafael will vouch you know for small business owners you know it it's both the cost of money and the time because if they lose time then they lose a lot of opportunity or let's say they I have to go and run my next payroll in the next two days time and I'm not able to do that you know then if I get money after two weeks that's not worthwhile for me anymore so so our take was that you know how we keep constantly lowering the cost of money giving better terms but at the same point of time increasing the speed because over last few years otherwise unfortunately what has happened was that you know uh, if you wanted money at a great speed you had to pay a very high price so we said how do we marry the speed which comes from technology online environment with cost of money which should be either bank bank cost money or close to bank cost money so I think those are the things that you know we are you know, constantly working towards, and that's what I'm very, you know, proud to say to today that you know we have cut down uh, the timelines of providing access to credit by almost 90 percent. You know, over last two years' time, uh, and also the terms have gone extended. Now we can go up to three years, five years. You know, we we just launched commercial real estate products where we can go up to seven years. You know, we can go up to five million dollars. You know, we are launching equipment financing. So the idea is that you know we are able to now give you a lot of these things, but you don't have to leave the platform, or even on the platform you don't you have to wait for individual lenders to come and you know speed up the process because we have speeded up that process on behalf of every single lender on the platform. Mm. Those are really great points. So you've cut the time to get capital, you've cut down the costs of the capital, uh, and you're doing it on a continuous basis. And you also said something else earlier I want you to touch upon just a moment, and that is you talked about how the biz to credit platform, it isn't just about going one time and getting a loan and no, you're done. No. It's, yeah. You are really created a CFO type of platform. Could you talk just a bit more about that, please? Yeah, so that is a very interesting tool that we have built that, you know, where you will come, you will apply for credit, you will actually give access to your personal credit, to your cash flow, uh, you know, and everything else. And now we are able to update all that information in real time on an ongoing basis. So that way, you know, let's say you run a small business and you want to see that, you know, what is your revenue? you know or how does your revenue look this year compared to last year or, or or how does your cash flow look whether you're getting your account receivables on time or not and all that and now you're able to map all that stuff on your dashboard you can see uh, what kind of loans you had borrowed from us what is the balance on those loans and you know everything else you know actually so i think i think those are the things that we have added more and more onto the platform because what we are trying to make it is into a more intelligent ecosystem now then you know just where you come one time get your credit here you can see all your loan balances you can see when you're ready for a renewal 
how much principal you paid, what is your interest you, that you paid, the whole breakdown, you know, how did you use the money, did it help you to grow your business or not, so all that stuff is there now. Mm, very impressive. That And that's really uh, been quite an improvement uh, and an addition since I first learned of Biz2 Credit um, several years ago, so uh, again, congratulations on that. Yep. Well, I'm afraid we are out of time. Um, this has been very great. I'd like to thank very much uh, Raphael Cuellar, a very uh, impressive entrepreneur, and thank you very much for sharing your insights and also your entrepreneurial journey. That was really interesting, Raphael. Thank you. My pleasure, and uh, thank you so much for having me. It was very interesting for me as well. Very okay. good. And I want to thank uh, Rohit Arora, the co-founder and CEO of Biz2Credit. And Rohit, where can people find out more about Biz2Credit? Yeah, so they can come on Biz2Credit.com. They can write an email at info at Biz2Credit.com or they can call our toll-free number, which is 800-200-5678. Uh, you know, so it's, uh, it's very easy. We have live chat support. We have live uh, loan specialist support, you know, 24 by 7. So, you know, they can call us anytime. They can get on a live chat. They can, you know, fill out an application, get free loan consultations. Uh, so it's 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 via email, via phone, or online. All right. Well, very good. Well, thank you all uh, very much. This is Anita Campbell, and the webinar is now concluded.